California. Porque Deus amou o mundo de tal maneira que deu o seu Filho unigênito para que todo aquele que nele crê não pereça, mas tenha a vida eterna. That's cumbersome, but beautiful, though. That is my phone. Oh, is that your phone? That's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what you are just eavesdropping on right now is Dave McIntyre, the guest for today's show, who some of you already know of as the winner of season two of History Channel's television program, Alone. If you don't know what Alone is, I can't advise you in any stronger way than telling you right now to, as soon as you're done listening to this podcast, go to your TV and watch as much Alone as you possibly can. It's a very Spartan program. There are 10 contestants who go out into the wilderness in various spots. For Dave's season, it was Vancouver Island, which is a cold weather rainforest, a climate I didn't even know existed here in North America. And you get you get to pick 10 personal items from a list of 50 potential things to bring along, a little bit of clothes, and that's it. Of course, you're also tasked with bringing a large set of cameras that you have to lug around with you because there are no producers, there are no camera people. This is you and nine competitors, each with their own four or five square mile radius, alone in the wilderness. And it is something special. And I don't want to get into it any further than that. You're going to hear from when we talk to Dave here shortly what's going on. But what you just heard was I asked Dave to give me a sound check. He said, I do know Portuguese. Maybe I can do something in Portuguese. He'll get into that a little bit with his experience with Brazilian mission work that he's done in his past. And so he went with it. And that what you just heard was the Bible verse, John 316 in Portuguese. It was beautiful. We were about to start to talk about his Brazilian background when his phone rang. And he had to take the call because it was something relating to his career. He took it, and as it turns out, what we just heard just now was Dave McIntyre receiving a phone call from his new employer. So sometimes people say, wow, I always remember exactly where I was when I got that job or something to that effect. Well, in this case, Dave McIntyre, the, the man's man of all men's men, got his new job while in the attic. So that's a first. That is definitely a first. Listen to what happened as soon as he hung up. I'm not going to play all the details, but here's what happened when we hung up. Man, alive. Congratulations, man. Can I get a witness? I got oh, it. That's awesome news. Let's go into the interview direct with Dave. Look, you're not going to hear a lot of music today. In fact, instead of music, I put together a little bit of a sound edit for what Dave heard for the 66 days that he spent on Vancouver Island, completely alone. There is no music other than whatever is going on in your head. There's nowhere to hide. As Dave said on the show, you're completely stripped down out there. In fact, when Dave said that on the show, he was actually talking about his personal life before he left. That's a whole different story for another time. But he was already kind of stripped down when he went out there. And then he really got stripped down. But now I'm rambling. You don't need to hear me telling you about Dave McIntyre being stripped down because Dave McIntyre is here to tell himself about getting stripped down. I'm super excited about this. It's our favorite show with some Vancouver Island sounds. Let's start the show. So, I mean, first off, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that as we were setting up for the show today, you received a call. We don't have to talk about necessarily exactly where if you don't want, but you just got a job right here in the attic. Yeah, actually, <laughs> uh, you know, when, when you when you win a half million dollars on a wilderness show, you get to quit the day job for a while. Right. And I've been all around, going all around the country speaking and uh, about men's meetings, retreats, churches, you know, things like that. And COVID shut all that down. And now I'm looking at, okay... I mean, my entire income just got blitzed Right from, you know, when this thing started, all of a sudden, you know, one by one, they started dropping off. Speaking engagements are particularly because it's a big crowd of people. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've, I've spoken to as many as 1500, you know, I had a, 
some really, really big venues, you know, I've been, been speaking, usually church events, things right. like that. But, uh, you know, like regional conferences and things like that have been, you know, not maybe the keynote speaker, but, you know, a speaker. And right. it's always fun to, for t- to tell the story. But, yeah, I've been doing that since the show and COVID shut all that off. And uh, I, I've been praying about it. And I said, Lord, you know, uh, a lot of crazy stuff's happening in America today. You know <sighs> what I mean? Especially, uh, I, I told my son, you know, you, you have to choose your battles, but you have to choose battle. Right. You know, you have to put yourself in the line somewhere. So I've been praying, Lord, you know, where, where do you want me? Put me in the line where you want me to be and give me the strength to stand in that place. And uh, shortly after that, a, a friend took me out to breakfast, wanted to bounce a proposal off me. And yeah, so I just uh, just got off the phone taking a very intimidating day job. So, that is so great, though, because the it's mission work. Well, it's, it's management of mission work. Yeah. The international representative, international director for a organization a ministry organization so yeah i'm very excited about that and uh very intimidated and excited about it but um i have a big god it, it's it's one of those things in my, my life has taught me how fragile and weak i am okay and broke broken me literally down to the last of my strength and when you there there's a certain if you if you lose all confidence in self when that happens. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you have to find that confidence and that strength somewhere else. Okay. And I know that I find that strength and confidence in God, my relationship with him, that I know that I can draw on him at any moment to, to do the thing that he's called me to do. Okay. Right. And he's, that's that for me, that was the lesson personally for being out there 66 days on alone was being broken down to nothing and having the last of my strength taken away and having him provide that strength moment by moment. And literally not having it any other th- I mean no other distractions there's no distractions yeah. out there other you know I, you you did such a good job on the show of describing I don't know if you mentioned Maslow's hierarchy in the show but I've seen since then you've been quoted as talking about this but yeah they, we, they did I, they did bring that on the show that was yeah that was great when, I think you said when there's when you don't have air you can, don't worry about water when you don't have water you can't worry about food but once you have all that stuff fulfilled you start thinking about your family right and all of that so where does God fit into there is he present is he present at the time where you're starving too? Yeah, no, that, that's that's a very good point. I've actually never been asked that. And Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs states that the lowest unmet need motivates. Mm-hmm. Okay, the lowest unmet need motivates. And you know, like if like 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 I said, if you're if you don't have air, you are not going to think about thirst. You're only going to focus on that air. And I would say it was a constant it was a constant prayer out there you know you're you know give us this day our daily bread you know it's like give me this day my daily greenling you know what i mean and like literally some, one literally one yeah fish, I, get, I get a fish to me i one thing one thing happened early on there i had five pounds of emergency pemmican okay so i get out there and i was it was one of my 10 items yeah okay. and pemmican for those who don't know it's dehydrated powdered uh meat we use bison to make mine. Um, dehydrated powdered bison, but it didn't have any flavorings, no salt, no. It's not jerky. It's just dried, dried meat. And then you powder that, and then you take fifteen uh, percent uh, berry powder. You know, berry powder. You you dry them till they're crispy, and you pulverize that. And you mix eighty five percent meat powder, fifteen percent berry powder. Which is the berry powder you were going to make in the field? No, no. This was all pre made. That's pre made. Okay, okay, it's all pre made. You mix the two, the berry powder and the meat powder together. I used uh, dried blueberries and cherries for the powder and then you saturate that with rendered suet okay or, or other fat but i use suet because i know suet sets up nice and hard mm-hmm. and uh it basically it's a perfect food for when you're in ketosis when your body's eating muscle tissue and body fat you know that was five pounds of me i got to keep and I, I planned on using that like i knew november i was not planning on tapping out i wasn't going out there to find myself it didn't seem like you, you know gonna tap out. i you know i'm <laughs> I, I, I say all the time, I'm not searching for God. I'm living with the consequences of having found him. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's a whole nother, whole nother battle there. Um, <laughs> I figured I would, I would save that. And at one point I'd gone 96 hours without a bite to eat. I mean, other than like limpets and, and seaweed, just, you know, mouthfuls of seaweed every once in a while. It, it, I was starving down. I was circling the drain. And early I, on, you didn't get, you didn't have any fishing success early on because of the patterns yeah, and you got skinny fast. Yeah. I didn't catch, I didn't catch my first fish until it was like two weeks in. Yeah, because that first that first two weeks was like a total fast almost. I was eating salal berries, uh, some seaweed, experimenting with different things. And the, I had a lot of bulk kelp, but I wasn't sure if it would bind me up. 
you know, a lot of wild a lot of foods. salt too, right? In it, well, or? yeah, you wash it out. Oh, you, know, yeah. you wash it in fresh water. But the idea, I had never eaten bull kelp before in my life. So does this stuff, you know, if you eat a belly full of bull kelp, is it going to bind you up into a ball and have to, you know, go home with an obstruction or something? Right. It's a loosener. You know, oh, it's, it's the very, opposite. yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's the opposite. Yeah, it was, it was good. It, it was, it didn't bind me up. Anyway, that first month was like a, like a 30 day fast. You know, it was pretty sparse. I lost 35 pounds, but I think, I think it was week five was my lowest weight loss. Did you go in about how you were built now? Uh, yeah, it was 195 when I went out. And then I, you was, ended up I losing... probably had more. I was at the time I was, I was, you know, lifting, running, trying to you know, get, get really in good shape right. and also gain weight because you wanted to gain body fat. So it's hard to do to gain muscle mass and body fat at the same time. Cause you're, you're working at cross purposes there. I found that it's very easy to do one of those. Right. <laughs> right. But to do them both, you gotta, you know, I was, I wasn't say I was like power lifting. Like I was, uh, you know, running every day, getting my cardio up and, you know, doing just body weight exercises at that point. But then I was, uh, eating like a hog as soon as i knew i was going to be on the show i just started pounding down the food you know what i mean crazy. just like carb carb loading how close were you to hitting the bmi number that's that's had people that's actually yeah, I, I don't know i don't know they didn't really they didn't really share those numbers in fact i didn't know that i had been i had been gaining weight uh since like week five regaining lost weight i was getting enough food to, that i was actually regaining weight and i didn't know that i uh, while I was on the show, I knew that from, from talking to one of the producers, I went to visit the, those guys out in New York and I thought, yeah, I was doing really good. He says, you were gaining weight. He, he was really wow. impressed. He told me, that. I'm like, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that I had, I had turned that corner. It didn't feel like it. When did you, know you end up eating the, the, con, what was the concoction you called? Pemmican? Yeah. I was going to get, get that. I went 96 yeah. hours at one point. I went 96 hours without a bite to eat. And I thought, you know what, I, I, this has to stop. You know, this would, you know, it's, it's emergency rations in 96 hours, you know, four f- complete days. That's an emergency. Were you seeing, like, and, were you feeling crazy mentally or what was that? What was the feeling? No, the, the process of starvation, you, you have that incredible hunger pangs in the beginning and then your body goes into like a detox mode and you get a wicked headache. So the first three days I was on the island, I had a screaming headache, just howling. And then, uh, that the body gets the message. Okay. We, the, we can turn off the alarm bell. You know, we know the ship is sinking. We can turn off the alarm and, you know, just have some peace. <laughs> so the body calms down, but then you, you get into like this lethargic stage where your body's forcing you to conserve energy. It's not like you don't care anymore. You intensely care about food, yeah. you know, and, but you just don't have, you just, you don't just spring out of bed and go do stuff. You know what I mean? You're <laughs> like, you consider what you have to do because your body's burning itself to, to do that. And it's an expensive way to live. You've only got about a month of that. Right. You know, anybody. And then, so after that four days, I broke down and I made myself a one sixth pound portion. You know, I took that, those blocks, you know, and I, I scored it like a, like a tic-tac-toe kind of thing. Yeah. And I broke out a, you know, a chunk of it, one sixth of a pound. And I, you, you, I put a maybe quarter inch of seawater in, in the bottom of the pot and then made it, you know, then about a quart of fresh water on top of that. And so it'd be like salty, like soup. Right. And then I put the pemmican in there and you melt that down and I had bull kelp and I put that in with the, you know, shredded bull kelp. And I cried when I had that first spoonful because all of a sudden I realized what it means to be someone who's starving to death and begin to give in a bowl of food, you know, just that little kindness, you know, that, oh, that man. one, you know, to us, we don't even think about it, but when someone is actually starving to death and on a loan, you're not just hungry, you're actually starving to death. You will die. And they pull people off when they get down to, I think it's 17 BMI, they, they'll pull them out. Well, they're also not right there. So you are also putting yourself at peril without like, it's, it's not like some other shows where there's cameramen and producers. Yeah, there's no one you're, there. you're on your own. You're on your own for maybe a couple hours, even if you hit the beacon. Well, they, they, they could have gotten to me uh, in about 45 minutes by boat. Which could be too late if you're hypothermic or, or yeah, or you yeah, have a, a, a bleed or a broken bone, or it's a long forty five minutes. Right. They could have gotten to me in about twenty minutes by helicopter, but only at low tide because there's no place to land anywhere near me other than on the beach at low tide. Right. That's the when they pulled me out. That's what they did. Now, when you were assigned your position or your location, did you immediately think to yourself, when did you find that out? And did you immediately start thinking like, okay, this is going to have the, this is what the advantages of this particular locale are versus disadvantages. Cause it seems like each one has those. Yeah. Because you are in kind of little micro area, microclimates each way. Well, you, you war game it out before you go. So you, know, you, you did you know where you're going to be before you went? I knew I'd be on Vancouver Island. But that's it. That's, that's the it. most. Okay. That's the most. And so you knew it was going to be wet and cold. Yeah. So, so drop day. I, I, I studied, like I watched season one. Okay. Season one was on Vancouver Island and I did, I didn't, I could care less what they were doing. I was looking at the land, 
know what I mean? I'm looking at the conditions. I'm looking at the land. What are the resources? What are the, what am I going to find there? And, you know, some of the tips, you know, that like uh, I think Lucas was drying seaweed and I did that. And at that it was something I did probably because I saw it on season one. But right. the rest of it was just I mean, I, I know how to assess the situation, you know, with my own prior skills and, and, and things. I, I don't need to. I don't need them to teach me what to do. I just need them to show me what I'm, where I'm going to do it. It's just like so, a scouting report. I'm gonna... Yeah. So I had, I had season one to look at it and that really informed my clothing and gear choices. And I think they were spot on from watching season one. I wouldn't have changed anything that I brought with. Me. Did you use the, the sleeping bag dryer thing or sleeping bag case? The, the baby bag? The baby bag? Oh yeah. That saved my bacon. For your sleeping bag? Yeah. Did you do that every day? Did you wrap that thing back up every day? Well, I just left it on my bed. Yeah. Yeah. I'd roll it up. Yeah. Uh, but it, but the sleeping bag was in the bivy 24-7. And I would just roll it up on the end of the bed so I could sit on the bed and, and kind of lean back on that. Right. Because I had a nice thick mattress. But the, um, yeah, I, I would take exactly what I took. I mean, down to the brand name. I, the only thing I would, I would change, I would have probably swapped out. I took all the, the same hook. And right before we left, I saw Jose had a halibut hook. Among he was one skilled. Of, he was very skilled too. Yeah. Oh, he's. I mean, the man made a kayak with a knife. <laughs> no, like you know really, it was like he was. It was so yeah. like symmetrical. Too. Yeah. <laughs> it, he, yeah. He's skilled off the charts. Yeah. Um, have you developed? Have you developed friendships with any of those former contestants? Yeah, or? we all stay in touch. That's really cool. Yeah, we all talk. But um, I, I the, the things I took, I, I'd, I'd take again. Uh, the clothing was spot on. I, yeah, I saw he had that halibut hook, and I think, man. And a halibut hook is huge. So I mean, that was to say, so it just would allow you to get a bigger fish. Is that the right? halibut hook it would actually you could heat it up and straighten it out, and make a spear. I mean, they're huge. Yeah, it's a huge hook. It's the kind of thing you would catch a shark on. You know what I mean? They're just gigantic. <laughs> and I could have used that uh, like a gaff, like putting it on a pole to, to pull crabs up. That would have been really easy to pull crabs out of the water with a gaff like that. The crabs ended up being. I mean, a lot of men out there and females as well probably thought like no one's ever said this, but in this case, crabs really helped your life out. Oh my goodness, yes. You were was... eating like a king kind of at the end. Dungeness crab every night. Oh, I called him Dungeness. Okay, and there's a story <laughs> behind that. Like the the first crab I caught. I saw one the very first day when I went out to my reef. I figured out when the, when the tide went down, I could get out across these channels and get out to my reef. And I get out to the far edge of the reef, and about 10 feet down in the water, I saw this enormous crab. And I had just no way to get to him. I didn't even have a fishing pole when I was out there that day. Yeah, you were just kind of scout walking. Yeah, I was just there. trying to scout and see if I could get out there. And there's this huge crab. And I'm thinking, man, I mean, they had claws just like, like a lobster. And I'm thinking, man, there's, there's giant crabs out there. And I, I thought I always thought of those crabs as being out there, okay, in the deep, in the deep water, right? Because I know Dungeness are a deep water crab. And it was like day thirty, my my net had collapsed in the surf, and I was really at that point just really d- uh, dis- discouraged about all my passive fishing uh, methods were just getting torn to shreds with it's too, too uh, much I mean, too, too much current too much there. debris in yeah. the water. Um, it was all bull kelp. I go out and check my net. It'd be loaded with you know hundred pounds, hundred or two hundred pounds of bull kelp. I saw one time you picked it up and said it was catch of the day, and it was just a big sack of bull. Kelp. Yeah, that was on a, that was on a set line. That was on a, on a like a like a trot line I'd set out. But the, yeah, the net would collect all that kelp, and every day I'd be resetting the net. Okay, so low tide was the only time I could get around to fish, but I had the net set up. So I, every time at dead low tide, I was stuck at that location for the net. And that seriously cut into the time I had to actively fish and I wasn't catching anything. Well, the one day I go out, it's like day 30 and there's this enormous crab in the net and it's all balled up and it's all destroyed. And I had to untangle the thing and I finally got it out and I took it back to my shelter and had this, this crab, uh, I ate this crab, but it's like the day later, I think they had med check. And I asked one of the Canadian cameramen on med check. I said, Hey, what kind of crabs do you have out here? And he, he said, uh, Dungeness crabs. I'm like, okay, I must be eating Dungeness crabs. And I know they're wicked expensive. So I'm eating like a king you really <laughs> and to come to find out they're Northern kelp crabs and the locals up there don't even eat them. Oh, they really don't really. even bother with them. Yeah. They have the big claws and stuff, but they don't have, they're not meaty. Like the, they're not so meaty as the Dungeness. Dungeness is just, but they're still fatty though. Right. Is there some fat, fat content? A uh, little bit, maybe not, not really, but for me, it was such an emotional boost to think I'm eating. You buy Dungeness crab around here in Grand Rapids, you pay like thirty dollars a pound. You know what I mean? And so I'm I'm feasting on these things, and yeah. I, I caught that a couple of days after I caught that first one, I caught six crabs yeah. on a line. Feast, and that was like the emotional turning point for me out there. I was just definitely, uh, I was pumped. You know what I mean? I, I had this this all you can eat crab feast, and then I started hitting into the 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 kelp crabs consistently. You know, every day I'm catching a couple of them. You know, so for like that last month out there, I probably ate 
a good 50, easily 50 of those crabs. Would you, would that be something you'd want to try again? Or that just Oh my goodness. Yeah. I'd, eat, I'd tuck into them and yeah. Oh yeah. And you're, you're supposed to only eat the male crabs and you know, leave the females go and stuff. And I was, Oh, because of the local ordinances or whatever. Or just well, that's the, how you, yeah. If, if you eat both of them, then your crab population dies off. If you eat only the females, all the males will, the, the remaining males will fertilize all the females every year anyway. Right. So you have the same population being born every, every year. If you eat females, it just cuts into your population. So you're only supposed to eat the uh, the male crabs. And and I was not doing that on the island. I was just eating everything I get my hands on. Right. But yeah, I oh, I definitely eat them again. And they're not a bad crab. I mean, it, they taste like any other crab. They just don't have the the meat weight in them that a Dungeness would. Yeah. So all the Canadians, you know, I'm calling them Dungeness crabs all through the show, and the Canadian people, <laughs> this man doesn't know anything. How could he be a wilderness yeah. survival expert if he doesn't even know the difference between a northern cup crab and a bed? It's like, I've never even been there. Yeah, really. You know what I mean? I've never been in that environment in my life, you know. And I only, I only knew they weren't Dungeness crabs. On the way out, there was in the Vancouver airport, there's a, a, a restaurant there, and it's like, the Dungeness house or something like that. And it had a, like a red outline of a Dungeness crab on the side. I'm looking at, and have this like sinking feeling like doesn't look they like were not Dungeness crabs I was eating. And every time I referred to them, I called them Dungeon. It was a fun word to say Dungeness. It, and it kind of, it works well alliteratively with your Desolation Cove, which is what you ultimately named your little camp yeah. there. Yeah. I think that that was the name I gave it in month one. Month two was, was a lot better. Yeah. It was kind of tongue in cheek after that. I, I ate, consistently well in my second month and like i said i was actually regaining lost weight now when you have been under a complete total fast like that your entire digestive tract is empty yeah okay you got nothing in the in the factory down there and i think some of that regained weight was just the fact that i was eating consistently and i had a full digestive tract you know that was moving along that's good though i I I wasn't out there you know bodybuilding and you know getting fat (laughs) I was, you know, but I had way more energy my second month. And the other thing that happens is as your body starves down, you have less muscle mass and you don't, you, you, you are able to run the engine at a lower idle. You know right. I mean? You don't need as much energy to, to, you know, your base metabolism is slowed down so much. Yeah. It, that's just like another, another example of your body kind of own, like, you know, making things happen so that yeah. it survives. It's you a adapt. survival tactic. Yeah. So you mentioned before we were t- recording, I think, but. <clears throat> you didn't. You had never seen crabs because most of your survival work, none of it was in Vancouver Island. That's for sure. No. But it seemed like you going into that show. You were qualified. Obviously, there was thirty five hundred applicants. They didn't just pick you. Uh, you had to earn that. And can you explain a little bit about what your background was that that led you to that point where you were even able to even consider going on the show, sure. let alone getting um, p- picked? I've never had a course in wilderness survival. I've taught a few, but I've never actually taken one. I've had a few people, you know, I've, I've hung out with some people that knew a lot of stuff. You know, actually, I, I this last weekend, I did a wilderness uh, skills course up in Cadillac at a friend's cabin. And uh, there was some uh, two edible plant experts just blew me out of the water. I mean, you're walking through the forest and they know every plant in the forest. You know, I can tell you what, what, what the what co- they, content is and what the nutritional value and all that. Too. Yeah, how to prepare it, when to pick it, you know, all these different things. Just to, there's there's people out there that know so much more. There's no such thing as a global expert on wilderness survival. Right. Okay, there's TV personalities that play themselves off as that. Okay, but they, they go out there in the week before they're walking around with a local and showing them all the things. Then they turn the cameras on. Right. You know, and right. all survival knowledge is local knowledge. You know, when it comes to getting fed, I grew up in eastern Pennsylvania and had a uh, lot of wilderness area right right behind the house and spent a lot of time out there as a kid. You know, I had my fort. You know, as a survival instructor, you have shelters. Right. As a kid, they're a fort. And I had my fort. So I got to live in my fort in Vancouver Island for two months. And that's, that's how I grew up, do, doing all that stuff. Is that out in the mountains? Uh, I lived in Westchester, Pennsylvania, which is uh, southeastern Pennsylvania, about an hour and a half outside of Philly. Okay. And uh, not maybe maybe an hour. Um, but we also had a house up in the mountains, up in the, the blue mountains, North of Reading. Um, it's beautiful out there. Yeah. It was, so we, I spent a lot of time in the woods and just really, I uh, enjoyed wilderness survival, you know, from about, well, in my young, in my childhood, I was just enthralled with uh, native Americans and uh, learning all the different things. And, um, later that turned into my brother and I going out in the Appalachians and, making a lot of mistakes and learning how to, how to deal with the wilderness. Right. And then I, in 19, I, 1990, I went to Brazil for two years. I got married when I was 23. So I've been like 24. Okay. My wife had grown up in Brazil. So we went down there to teach American missionary kids and I got to see, you know, the different, uh, 
uh, jungle and savanna and different you know ecosystems there in Brazil. And then we went back in uh, 1999 as as full time missionaries. But I was working in an urban church, and uh, to get out of the city, I would go I start going out to the uh, the wilderness down there, and showing the kids pictures of it, and they're just like, oh, Pastor Mac, you got to take us out there, you know. And <laughs> so I started the uh, Perardua Wilderness Ministry in in Brazil, which was uh, using wilderness survival training as a springboard for leadership and spiritual development. Wow, that would, what a, like a perfect. Yeah. The bush is the perfect classroom because cause and effect are instant. Okay, you you literally you make your bed and you lie in it. Okay, and if you do a poor job with that, and, and everything had, like in my speaking and teaching ministry, I, I always got high marks in like illustrating, and you know being able to bring things that they know and, and teach the unknown. And, and wilderness survival really lends itself to that. Right. One of the exercises I would do uh, at the end of the thing, like it, this one location, we were camp, we would camp in a river valley, and it's about a two mile walk. It's not a far walk to get out to where we park the car, but it's up all uphill. You know, getting out of that river valley. And I would have the, the kids draw straws and their, their packs only weighed about 20 pounds, but they would all draw straws and whoever lost had to carry all the packs, yeah, right. including mine. So this kid's loaded with, you know, five, five or six packs <laughs> and they all weigh about 20 pounds and it's cumbersome and it's, it's horrible and it seems like torture. And all the kids would jump around, ah, you got to carry the packs. Yeah. You know, so then we start hiking out and it's like 90 degree heat, humidity, you know, you're, it's jungle right. and uh, you're climbing up this steep rocky slope to get out of the jungle and that the kid starts to fail you know he's just broken down and he's you know they're stumbling and sweat's just pouring out of him and stuff and the kids would be like uh pastor mac can we get our packs because now they're seeing one of their friends suffer you know can we get our packs and we're like no you can't and we get about halfway up and and i'd ask the, the guy hey can you, you want us to take the packs no i got it i got it they all want to tough it out you know right and uh i'd stop and say why, why am i doing this what's the what's the purpose of this i said guys this is your average church right here where one guy's carrying all the load and everyone's just having a grand old time just yep. being born along, you know, and this is what it looks like, you know, to, when someone's suffering under a, a, a load they can't bear. Right. You know, and the Bible teaches us to carry, carry our own burden, but also carry each other's burdens as well. And there's sometimes there are people can't even carry their own pack. You know, they need the help. Yeah. But most of the time we're just piling our packs on other people and right. crushing them. Yeah. We're know? all guilty of that for sure. Yeah. And it, it, and I'd hear about that like years later, you know what I mean? It, it, I would, I would say all the time, you, you're going to forget a lot of weekends out of your life. You were never going to forget this weekend. And you get those same groups of kids together five, ten years after it. That's all they talk about was per ardua. And per ardua was Latin for uh, through difficulty. It's also the McIntyre family motto. Oh, wow. And the motto of the Royal Air Force. But I think the McIntyres had it first. Is McIntyre uh, Scottish? Scottish. Scottish. Scott, uh, well, I'm a Ross, which is a Scottish name go. as well. Wow. Well, our ancestors probably slaughtered each other. Um, <laughs> probably. Yeah. We're wickedly violent people we are. Yes. We paint ourselves... You know, there's something about a guy painted blue, swinging a sword, wearing a dress. You just says, give this guy some room. You know what I mean? It's just... <laughs> well, it's, all right, you guys, you guys can have it. That's who we were, yeah. <laughs> and we've toned it down. I mean, we have a war cry and all that. If I said it, I have to kill somebody, I think, you know? <laughs> so so but, say it again. What's the family motto? Per ardua. In Latin, it means through difficulty. And as a McIntyre, I now know that we create our own difficulties. You know, that's the difficulties that... That's, you know... This is kind of a struggle, not even a struggle, but a realization I'm coming to, and it, it, it create, could create a struggle, which is that <clears throat> through difficulty or through struggling, of course, is where all of the best lessons come from. Exactly. Maybe all of the lessons. That's why That's why I named the course that. But, but then isn't then, is there some tendency maybe, is that where self-destructive behavior comes from? Or you know what I mean? Because you know, it, do, do you see, do people seek no, out the, the struggle self- because they know it's going to maybe make them better in some sort of subconscious way? Some some people do. Yeah. Okay. In, in a healthy way, it's like, like an athlete pushing himself, you know, beyond, you know, the, the, their limits and finding, you know, bring, there's something about being brought to the edge of your strength. Right. Okay. When you get taken to the edge of your own personal strength, and you know your limitation, okay? You know your fragility, and it, it, it teaches you humility, okay? I, I always, it's a red flag for me when someone claims to have a lot of wilderness experience and they come across as arrogant and, and full of themselves and stuff. It's like, ah. Uh, you, you haven't. <laughs> no, no. You have not had your head handed to you, okay, by the wilderness. And if you haven't, you didn't go in deep enough, you didn't stay long enough, right. okay? The wilderness teaches you that, and I think life teaches you that. The, the, who, no one can handle everything in life. You know, and it's going to break us down at some point. And, you know, failure is a very real option and it's very instructive. I think it's more instructive than success. When you succeed at something, it's, yeah, it's a, hey, we'll just do this again. 
Yes, you know, uh, yeah. there's why you don't even have to tweak it. You know, it worked. <laughs> you know, I can. That's kind of the problem with like winning alone. Well, what were the things I did wrong out there? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, whatever I did, it worked. You know what I mean? It all came, I, I, it came together. And you weren't even that close. You weren't close to quitting, really. No, I never that wasn't even an option. No, right? I never hovered over the button, quitting. I felt like God had me in a. God wanted to teach me something with the whole experience, and and he he did, but. I didn't feel like I had the right to just call it off, you know, and besides I'm given this opportunity, you know, that people think, Oh, you did it for the money. Well, yeah, it's a half million dollars. You, you know had a mean? great quote in there, by the way. Yeah. And we just watched it. I'm not some stalker or something, okay. but you said, I'm not, this isn't about the money for me. This is about the money for my kids. Yeah. And, and you were, you were going through whatever it was else was going through on your personal life. What an opportunity. And oh, man, did you take advantage yeah, of it? Yeah. I'll figure out how can I just punch out of that? You know, because I'm tired, wet, and want to go home. I've been tired, wet, and cold, and want to go home. One. Other days, you know what I mean. I've I've worked other jobs that didn't have that payoff. You know, I remember working here in Michigan, and I ripped off one of my thumbnails. I, my hands were so cold, I didn't even know it. You know what I mean? That's a sucky day. You know what I mean? As I have my thumbnails gone. Yeah, and that was for like 150. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the paycheck. truck, and there's blood all over my computer. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, I've done really horrible jobs at times you know I, I i worked stripping rubber off of electroplating racks where i had to work in a gas mask all day you know what i mean coated in rubber in 95 degree heat a company that made electroplating racks and when i wasn't delivering i got that job because i was the only person there that hadn't lost my license to dui <laughs> and the guy says i was going to a christian college at the time he sees it on my little you know form there and he says uh he says uh baptist bible college he says you people don't drink do you and i said no i don't drink he says he says, you can promise me this summer you're not going to lose your lose your license for, for DUI? I said, yeah, sure, of course. And he says, he opens up the door of the shop. He says, take a look out here. Every one of those guys, not a driver's license among them because they all lost their licenses to DUI. I can't, I have no one to drive my truck. So I'm like, yeah, I'll drive your truck. And the guys there hated me because I got to leave that infernal place, you know, a couple of days a week and, you know, drive out to like York, Pennsylvania and deliver a load of racks, and spend the day in the car. Uh, cause and effect, I suppose. Yeah, it was, it was great. But it was a horrible job. I mean, it was just... It's terrible. And so here I am on a loan, you know, I'm out in this beautiful place. Yeah, I'm not eating anything close to a normal diet, but it was just cool. Was, was it like scary? Coolest... No. No, I wouldn't say fear was ever a dominant emotion out there. But like scary in a psych like a well you're so you're so faithful and not to say that it wasn't ever tested out there, but I'm not I don't have the level of faith that you have. I just know I don't. Well, I'm, and, and so like I think for me it would be like the spiritual feeling of being alone, which is a great title for the show because you are just alone. You are. That is absolutely real other than those med checks every 7 to 10 days. How yeah. valuable are those just to get some get some uh, little bit of talking? You know they you, you you would think that. Okay, in the in the beginning especially, they are very they don't talk to you. You know what I mean? They show up. It's all business. I mean, the, produ the producer is usually the producer, the, the survival consultant, and then a cameraman. And they always film them to prove that you were okay. They would take my camera and film me during that. And then they take you know, the chip out of it and, and right. leave. Right. But um, they're just asking you, you know, any new injuries? They want to know what you shot, what film, you know, what, 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 are they, what are we looking for in your footage this week? Okay. Any new injuries? Uh, any worries you have? Any, you know, anything going on any symptoms you got going on and then they're looking at your feet and they're you know taking your vitals and all and that then they're out of there and then they bolt yeah and the cameraman just goes off and restocks the batteries and then they uh they ask you a few questions and they bounce you know quick med check you know they're taking your temperature they're looking at you know for for fever um blood pressure and uh every couple of weeks they would weigh us they'd yeah. have to sit in a scale they'd hang it in a tree and you sit in a little seat and they weigh you and an actual doctor would be there for that but they're very impersonal. There's no back rubs and barbecue on the beach when they're coming. You know, they, they don't. In fact, they're, every once in a while, they would have to come out and do some random thing like my satellite phone went down. Oh, yeah, just random and, technical items. Yeah, and if we had, we were allowed to use the communications if we had an injury, if we wanted to tap out, if we didn't th think we were, were psychologically holding it together, or if uh, anything was going wrong with the filming. Okay, that if we had a you know, the main camera goes down, they have to bring you a new one. Well, yeah, the show must go on. Yeah, yeah. or uh, well, my satellite phone died. I couldn't get it to charge, and I had to send them a text on the yellow brick saying, you know, my satellite phone was DOA. So they come out the next day, and uh, I'm trying to think uh, who it was. It was one of the one of the survival consultants was on the uh, on the boat, and uh, 
he pulls up and I was engaging him in conversation as he's pulling up and standing on the rocks, you know, it's like high tide and they're going to pull up to the rocks and just back off. So I started talking to him and he, he's, he, just, he just smiles like that. And he hands me the satellite phone and he says, right, we're going now. The, that the was it. Head, it's like no soup for you. You know what yeah. I mean? You do not get a conversation out of yeah. this. Otherwise everyone would be ruining their phones all the time. And yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. No soup for you, you know, <laughs> right. We're going now. <laughs> oh man. So, so what, you didn't have fear out there. You got through it. You won. Like you said, you didn't, my fear, the, the fear I did have is I, I kind of knew in the back of my head, I was going out of there with an injury that one of these days I'm going to like see one of my bones, you know, and, and I'm, so I'm going to break something. I'm going to get a head, head injury. I'm going to slip in the rocks, break a knee or something, you know, break a hand. Uh, that, that was like the only fear I had to consciously suppress is, and, and what that did was just made me very careful. Right. You know, just, it just makes you extremely cautious. And those rocks are at low tide. That's the only time you can move around and it's all covered with seaweed and it's all slimy. And I'm wearing muck boots, which don't have any kind of lateral stability. Oh, they're so they jagged stretch. too. I mean, if you fall on those, you can, oh yeah, those rocks are, and it's all like barnacles and yeah, it's, it's very jagged rock. So that was the only time I was afraid. And uh, that was the only fear I had. And then there was two times I was almost swept into the ocean by like rogue waves and if that had happened, I probably would have drowned because I never wore my, they gave us a, a, like a personal flotation collar thing. And I probably should have had that on every day if I was out there fishing and never wore it. I just hung it up in my shelter, never bothered with it. Now, that was probably a safety mistake I made yeah. is not carrying that every day. But you got so much stuff you already got to carry. That was the only time I was afraid. And I had a thing when I lived in Brazil, I could, I could sit here and tell you stories for hours about, you know, scary stuff that happened in Brazil. And I managed to get out of 15 years in Brazil and never got injured, you know, by a criminal or any, any of those things, right. but a lot of close calls. And I just had this thing, one more thing that never happened in Brazil. It's like, oh, that guy was, you know, scoped me out to rob me, but I got out of the box, you know, and, and one, one more thing that never happened in Brazil. You know, I was going to a church one night and I got off the wrong exit. I was speaking at a church I'd never been to before. So I, I got off the wrong exit and there was no on-ramp to get back on. So I'm driving through this unfamiliar Brazilian city and I turned down the wrong street. And I knew as soon as I turned down the street, there was nobody on the street. Okay, and there's people walking everywhere else. And as soon as I turned down the street, there's no one there, which means the local drug gangs have told they've like a, done a curfew. Right. And I figured, okay, I need to get out of here, but I had to, I had to drive down the street to a place I could turn around and get out. And as I'm moving there forward, a shot rang out and went right over the car. Someone fired a warning shot over the car. And I just threw it in reverse and just smoked tires out of there. <laughs> and I turn and, okay, now I turn down another street and there's people on the street. And I get, I'll get to the church where I'm going. And now I got to preach a message. Yeah, it's just one more thing that never happened in Brazil. Right. You know, the guy, if he wanted to hit me, he probably could have hit me, but he fired a warning shot. Okay. Right. Now I'm not going to carry the what ifs of that all day long. Right. Okay. I'm not going to lay in bed at night and fear. Oh no. What if that had happened? What if this, how, cause yeah, you're, you're a prey species there. You know, you're, you, you stay alert and you realize that a lot of bad things can happen. You just pay attention. And that's kind of how I took it in on Vancouver Island. Like the time I almost got swept into the water by a big wave. I'm like, okay, it didn't happen though. So now I just know, okay, yeah, exactly. that's a dangerous place. You know, these are dangerous things. The day I fell in the water, that, oh, that was, that sucked. That was like day thirty or something. Yeah, it was about in about in, about the midpoint. The water, the water temperature, I mean, the water was just ice water falling into it. I mean, it's the 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 Pacific Current there. It never gets down to like the super cold, but yeah, you fall into forty degree water with all your wool on. You know what I mean? I was soaked up to about mid belly, yeah. and all that wool, you know, was just sopping wet. Both my arms up to the elbows. And was hypothermia your main concern at that point? On that day, yeah. Yeah, so how did you, how did you get out of that? Just fire it um, up? In our clothing allowance, we were allowed two pairs of pants and uh, and, and also like a, a fleece. And I, I knew I had a pair of wool pants in my pack and a, a fleece I was using as my pillow. And I just got there. You know, I pulled my boots off and drained them because they were completely filled with water, the big muck boots up to my knees. Um, just sloshed back to camp with all that wet and just stripped it all off. And I was able to put on that that dry fleece it was a u.s military fleece uh jacket kind of thing in those wool pants and uh yeah and then i just spent the entire rest of the day with a roaring fire just drying out all my clothes and that's oh that sucked because the only the only fuel you had there was cedar 
in cedar when it burns it just burns to ash it doesn't leave coals it just completely burns away right to nothing and i had to supply a hardwood you know, the like different woods that, that didn't get left coals. And I was using that to dry bull kelp. I'd make a fire with those nice coals and use that radiant heat to dry my bull kelp. And I had to burn all of it. And it's expensive when you're cutting it by hand with a saw and all that, you of know, course, and, yeah. and lugging it all back to camp and waiting for it to dry. And I mean, it was like the most expensive clothes dryer <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> but so necessary. I mean, you couldn't survive wet up there. It was already wet up there. It's yeah. like it's like what it rains two hundred and forty days a year or something there. Or? Yeah, twelve feet of rain a year. That's crazy. No one it, yeah. it, that was baffling to me. Even I it's didn't even know that how much it existed it until I saw it alone. Yeah, it. I, I knew it was up there. I, I knew it was beautiful, but I never, I'd never seen it. Never been in it. I've been in rainforests before. You know, in rainy season in Brazil, you got where I was. It was called Mata Atlântica, which is the uh, Atlantic bush. It's not the same as the Amazon, but it's oh. it's single canopy jungle. In the rainy season, it's rainforest. And then when you hike up into the mid elevations there, you get into a landform called Cerrado, which is like a, it's like scrub brush, savanna type thing. And right. in dry season, that turns into desert. Oh. So you can park the car in the exact same place. And depending on the time of year, you can be in a rainforest or a desert. It's weird. Yeah, it's amazing. For wilderness survival training, oh my goodness, it was just like everything you'd ever want for wilderness survival training. Yeah. You do it all year. You know, you can... I mean, it seems like Michigan and Pennsylvania... And Vancouver, aside from the climate difference, like, what's the... The flora and the fauna. The flora and the fauna, yeah. I mean, are they similar? Um, Up there, no, they are Vancouver Island. Mich- Michigan is. To, to me, Michigan and Pennsylvania look a lot alike. Right. Unless you get up in, like, the UP, then it's more like, you know, boreal-type forest. And down here, it's deciduous. It's very, very similar to Pennsylvania, where I, where I grew up. But on Vancouver Island, it's just lush. It's green. It looks just like jungle. I mean, you got ferns that are like four or five feet tall in the forest. It's so know? hard to just, see that from the camera. Yeah, and everything's covered with moss, and everything's dripping and wet, and, and everything is sopping wet all the time. And the, the ground is just covered with, like, sphagnum moss. And there's no soil in the forest there. It's all just rotted wood vegeta- rot, rotted wood and vegetation. You light a fire on the ground there, and it just burns itself down, down, down into the ground. There's no actual mineral soil. Like bad, No yeah. dirt. There's right. so much rain, the dirt's gone. And there's so much growth that you all that rotten wood and everything. And then it, it's just amazing. And the water table is just under the surface. So like, like I got there, I set up my first uh, prim- my, my uh, provisional shelter. Okay. You, you don't want to build a, a permanent shelter until you get a handle on the weather. So I built this provisional shelter in a little hummock of, of uh, land that was like higher than the other forest floor and just completely covered with green moss. Right. Great place to sleep. Yeah. So then I picked out four other locations where I could build a permanent shelter. And then we got this storm that first week, like 65 mile hour winds, driving rain, and the entire forest flooded. And I realized the water table is just inches below that soppy mess on the floor. And it, three of the locations were completely underwater. And I'm talking like nine inches deep water. Yeah, I mean... You know, they, 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 then you realize there's like a dam of, of like rotting vegetation and logs all along the front by the beach. And all that water just backs up in the forest. It was completely flat in there. And it was just completely, so, you know... So then high ground is your flat. answer? The only place that was out of water was where I built my shelter. It, it was also flat-ish. It wasn't, you know... But it was, but it was the, high, right? It was a little bit... It was on the slope behind where my forest ended. And it just kind of climbed up into a, like like a really steep embankment yeah. and it was like part way up that embankment there was a flat spot and I, that was the place i built my shelter and it worked out perfectly for me that, that did lengthen your time your distance to the water and all that other no stuff. it wasn't that far away oh, and the, the forest wasn't that big okay. i had i had this little patch of flat forest and then right behind it it just climbed into this really steep slope it was like choked with salal, which is like a, it doesn't have thorns, thankfully, but it's very tangled, woody brush, like kind of like mountain laurel would be. Yeah, it seems like everyone was getting caught up in this. Oh, it's, 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 it's horrible, horrible stuff. If I, had, if I had a machete, it would have been great. I would just made trails through it all over the place, but I didn't have a machete. Yeah, you brought, so what were your 10 items then? You brought your food? Yeah, I had the, the pemmican, uh, sleeping bag, the bivy bag, uh, two quart pot, ferro rod for, you know, spark maker for making fire. Knife, axe, saw, gill net, and 300 yards of fishing line and 25 folks. So all of you listening, I mean, that's not a lot of things. It's no, it's not. You hear 10 things, you're like, oh, that's but not hard. Then you really got to think about it. Yeah, like, but if you know wilderness survival, you also know I have all my bases covered with that. 
I mean, it's a very good toolkit. Was that pretty much what? Was that pretty standard with whatever other people brought? Pretty much, a couple people took bows. Though season one, I, the guys who took bows didn't shoot anything, so I figured that's probably not a good option. Not in that climate, at least. There's not a lot in the land to live off of in terms of the animals. Were you doing any trapping? No, I didn't. I. Uh, there's not a lot there, and moving around in that forest is very, very difficult. But it was, I, uh, I knew going in there that I'm going to live off the ocean. And everything, my strategy was to get pretty much everything I ate out of the ocean, and pretty much I did. What are those greenlings? Are they tasty? A greenling? Yes, yeah, they're not a. They're very bland fish. You know, them and the sea perch, they were very bland. The greenling was would, would hold together when you. I, I everything I ate, I ate as stew. I would just make like a seafood boil with everything I collected during the day, and I only ate one meal a day, always in the evening. And I did that for a reason that when you when you're starving to death, those alarm bells are going off constantly. And if you nibble all day long, they never shut off. Okay, if you get a one big meal and you're satisfied all of a sudden, it's like your body relaxes, your mind relaxes. It's like, oh, okay, finally we got a meal. That's like yeah. this fad diet of intermittent fasting. You were kind of doing that. Oh, absolutely. So one might say Dave McIntyre started intermittent fasting. No, ancient man <laughs> oh, okay. lived that okay. way for you know up until now. The problem is obesity, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Ancient man did not have that problem. He, we're, we're designed to intermittent fast. You yeah. know, it's a, it's a healthy process. You just don't want it to go too long. You know, I would, every meal I got was after 24 hours of fasting. I'd eat one meal a day. That's the, the pattern I fell into. Yeah. And I wouldn't touch the emergency rations unless I had been in a complete fast for 48 hours. Did you bring any of that? No. Is that I did. I came, I came home with two and one six pounds of my pemmican. Did you finish it? Oh, no. I still have it in my freezer. Just it lasts case. forever. You know, but it every time, every once in a while, I'll, I'll uh, go and take a bite of it, and it puts me right back in my shelter on Vancouver Island. Oh, well, that's what I was going to ask. So, how long? So, you were not one of the people that went out there looking for uh, uh, some sort of spiritual growth. You had already experienced that. That's not to say you didn't have spiritual growth out there. You certainly did, but you kind of knew you were very strong in your faith going out there. In fact, it yeah. got you through in a lot of ways. Um, you had your kids. You had a very singular focus as to what you were doing. First off. Your son was just a fantastic climber on the yeah. episode that we saw. How did he learn that? Did he get that from you? Oh, uh, he's been a monkey. The first, he, he learned to climb before he could walk. And we lived in an apartment, and uh, we had to put nets across the windows. There's a company that came in, and they, they installed these safety nets in the windows. We were on a you know, fifth-floor apartment. All right. And there were times we'd, we'd catch him standing on the window still holding onto those nets. He climbed, Yeah, he started climbing up the uh, stairwell that went to our we had a rooftop patio on your top floor of the apartment. And... He would he was climbing on the railings and stuff before he could walk. Like you know, kids will hold on to things and kind of walk around, right. holding on to things. Well, he would start climbing. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. So then when we built our house, it had like a trellis outside. It was made of cement, and he had hung that with ropes and everything, and you know, slack line, all that stuff. He, if you ever you ever wanted to find Daniel in the jungle, you didn't look down, you looked up. He yeah, right. he climb he could climb trees like you know they they climb like trees to get the coconuts. Like a, I saw him doing that on the show. Like a he monkey. Like, yeah. Yeah. Then he just goes right up. Dude, yeah, what, that's a good skill. Yeah, he's, he's super flexible. I mean, right. yeah, all of his all of his young years, he always had calluses between his big toe and his other toe. Cause he like he would pinch the ropes, you know, with his toes and and climb ropes and things. Yeah, he's always climbing stuff. That's a, but you were but so and then you had your two daughters as well. What a touching moment it was when uh, your daughter came out and you yeah. thought you were there for a med shack and it, you saw her out of context and you almost had to remember who, who is this person. Yeah, almost. and that was so cool. I think that my favorite part about that reunion was when she said, oh, it's so beautiful here. And you said, it's not always like yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> this is they like came, a picturesque day. But that was like, a perfect day. I mean, that was like the calmest day. There's like there's like an eagle flying across. It looked like so idyllic, I think it's the word you use. And like, the reality is it was damp and hellacious there most of the time. Most of the time. In the beginning, it was nice. and it, We actually had a drought. It was like, like seven or nine days in the beginning where we didn't have rain. And I was totally dependent on my rain catch. I had a little tiny stream, but I had to boil that water. Right. Yeah, you know, I wasn't going to take it. I probably could have drank it, but I didn't want to take the chance. So you were. So your plan was to just drink rainwater. Yeah. And my, is that pretty much pure? For the most, enough. Okay, you're you're taking a chance. Like in the jungle, I would never drink rainwater that's coming through a jungle canopy. Because there could be poisonous toxins or something. No, because the monkeys do horrible things up there. Oh, I got you. You know, there's there's monkeys fornicating up above you, and you're going to drink that water. No. <laughs> Um, birds are crapping on the canopy. Your son's up there doing God knows what. Yeah, there's all that stuff up there. You just and jungle. If you like, you set up a shelter in the jungle, and you know, like we would sleep under a lot of black plastic tarps, and you'd always have like a pocket in the corner somewhere that would collect rainwater, and it's brown like tea. 
Yeah. You know, it's, it's got all kinds of stuff in it. On Vancouver Island, I was taking a, a chance that the canopy wasn't that active. And there's so much rain. It's just like... How much could really build up there if it's yeah, just yeah. I, I took a chance on it. So my yeah. half my shelter was set up as a rain catch. The 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 one wall, the windward, the cyber that got the wind, it kind of went down across the ground and up over a log. So it always had twenty gallons of water or so circulating in there. And wow. I just drank un you know unfiltered pure just rainwater out of that all the time. It had always had like a, a mass of hemlock needles over the top of it, so it kind of got like this hemlock t- taste to it which I kind of grew to resent that taste right. because every, every meal you're eating, there's hemlock needles falling in it and you're chewing on them and just <sighs> like, you can drink hemlock tea and that's not water hemlock. That's you know the, the tree. It's a different, it's not poisonous. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. The water hemlock's the plant that grows in like streams and stuff. That's the Got one that's it. deadly poison, but right. you can make hemlock tea. And I, oh, after a while, I just couldn't bear the taste of it. I'd make uh, spruce tea, which was nice. And you do that because it just gives you variety or are you it's getting some vitamin nutrients C. out of it? Yeah. Vitamin C. You had some training, obviously not training, but understanding of the of the uh, plant life up there and what, what was edible. But how much stuff were you coming across where you just couldn't take a chance? Mushrooms, things like that. We had like like other shows do. We had a uh, a wilderness uh, edibles expert come in, as part of orientation, and gave us a walk through the woods and pointed out different things. And of course, when I knew we were going to, uh, we had about a month. And I had made like flashcards of like all the the berries cool. and plants and stuff that I could all the edibles there. I got uh, salal berries like on day one. I was eating salal berries, which they were going out of their their season. They were kind of a lot of mushy, but that first week I probably had a quart, at least a quart of them. Um, were they tasty? Yeah, they're good. They're kind of bland, yeah. like a bland blueberry kind of thing. Um, licorice root fern. Uh, it exactly is what it sounds like. It's a fern root that tastes like licorice. I made tea out of that. Ate a lot of uh, bull kelp, wads and wads of bull kelp. And in the beginning, I'd, I'd you know pick through the bull kelp heads and I'm x-raying them against the sun to make sure they're perfect and all this stuff. And I'd carefully dry them and rinse them and prepare them. And at the end, I was just taking fresh bull kelp heads and just throwing them in the trees out in front of the camp. Yeah, you're one with the you're one with the woods now. Yeah, I'd but. stagger I'd stagger b- back home with you know I got the three fish I'm going to cook. I'd stagger home and just whack off a big section of it, just throw it in the pot. You know, I was just totally jaded to the stuff after eating you know a couple dozen pounds of the of it. What was your first meal when you got home? Or not when you got home. Like when the first time you said, you know, what, I'm doing it. it you you kind of be had to be pretty empty. I mean, you, eating a lot of food couldn't have been appealing, really. You know, every every movie you ever see of like like the starving soldiers, you know, or these guys who've been starving, has been starving a long time, and they get around food, and and they just show them just cramming it into their face, just, right. ah, and, you know, they're tearing. It's completely for me, at least, it was a complete opposite reaction. You're looking at this spread of food. Like they pulled me out the day before Thanksgiving, so on it, the first real meal that I had <laughs> with the crew and my daughter and stuff, they were cooking. Yeah. They had not prepared anything in in advance. They had like a like a veggie plate thing they had bought and they were cooking like hamburger patties with cheese on them and stuff and <laughs> i think there was like the, like veal parmesan or you know it was like some version of that and i'm just sitting there and looking at the entire bowl of gu- you know guacamole and chips and this veggie carrots you know crunchy crunchy carrots and eating apple wedges and just you just sit there and you just start nibbling and then you can't stop <laughs> you know you're nibbling and you think oh, i'm kind of full and then you look, oh, there's food, you know, and, you know, if I'm going to eat food, oh, raisins are amazing, you know what I mean? You're <laughs> just like, you're rediscovering everything. But for me, the, the one that really gets me is they, they, they gave me this uh, cabin where Aaron and I had these two cabins we we're going to stay in, and it, I had to be there for like a week before they would let me around people again, you know, and just kind of reintroduce yourself to society. Oh, just like psychologically and all that? Yeah, you need like a decompression. You, you would not have wanted to be in the Vancouver airport on the day they took me out. Yeah. Because you change psychologically. You become, I wouldn't, it's not savage. You become like fully human. You know yeah. what I mean? You become this, this predator. Survive, you're, 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 survival. you're just, you're, yeah, you have no sense of empathy for uh, animals, things like that. I mean, just, they're just, you're dead and I'm eating you. Right. And no apologies given. No permission asked, no apology. Well, you talked you're, about it on the show. You said after six, after thirty days, or maybe after sixty days, something becomes a lifestyle. It's not just a situation yeah. anymore. And you said, I don't know if I like that or something like that. Well, you, you're Is that change, what you're referring you, you to? change psychologically. I was going to tell you about. I get back to that cabin. We'll, we'll revisit this here. Yeah. You, I get to that cabin, and there was a jar of peanut butter in there. Adams Crunchy Organic Peanut Butter. 
and I ate that entire jar of peanut butter in about 12 hours just with a spoon. <laughs> it just good. tasted so good. It's so rich and fat, you know, didn't, didn't that sweet. You probably had no fat out just, there. Yeah. Oh, just <laughs> chowing down on spoonfuls of peanut butter. It was great. But no, you change psychologically. I noticed it with my dreams. In the beginning, I would dream about food and people. Okay, because that's what you're, you don't have any food and you don't have any people. So every dream I had would be, I'd, I'd be like at dinner with my kids. Or I'd be shopping in downtown Bella with the Central Market, you know, and there's cr- crowds of people and I'm filling up a cart with food and all the things I like to eat. Then you wake up and you realize, oh man, I'm on Vancouver Island and I have no people and nothing to eat, no coffee. Right. I have to function. Get out there and do it, you know. But um, then after a while, my dreams became, I would dream about uh, getting food out of nature. Always these wordless dreams where I'm hunting or I'm fishing or I'm catching crabs, and there's no people there. It was just me, Your just the just the animal satisfaction of of the kill, hunting something down and eating it. You know what I mean? And it feels good to be that guy. It really does feel good to let that. That's like that Homo Sapiens 1.0 programming we have, and it feels really good to let that guy off the leash, just to be that guy. You know that you're engaging with something that you know you're supposed to be. Right. You know, you're. you're there's no other option. Yeah, but it's like. We've we've dumbed that down, and 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 we don't give that guy any legitimate place to express himself. You know that it's not aggression, and I, I say you know, lions don't hate gazelles; they love gazelles. Right. They love to chase gazelles, and they love to tear them down, and they love to eat them, and yeah. they growl and they roar. But it's but it's a growl of victory. It's success. It's cool. It's, yeah, it's not murder. Or something. Yeah, they don't hate those gazelles. They love those gazelles. They. They love to watch the gazelles, and they they watch them bounce around. Every once in a while, like they rumble in the stomach, and they go and they eat one of them. But they don't hate them. Right. There's no, it's not, it's not savagery. It's not brutality. It's just, this is how we eat, you know. And you know, we we ha- we're so desensitized to that, you know, that the killing of our meat is done away from our eyes we have no idea if, if, if they made people kill their own animals that oh, I, a lot people of people eat meat a know? lot of vegans no they'd probably you know their kids wouldn't their kids would just grow up killing animals like their parents did you right. know like their grandparents our grandparents did on season six uh jordan spoiler alert here if you haven't seen season six don't don't listen to me right now but um, he shot a moose and it was kind of a kind of a high lung shot you know, which is actually good. You know, it's like a mega middle lung shot, which means the animal's going to bleed into his, into his lungs and, and, and drop. And everybody criticized Jordan for not putting another arrow into that moose because they have no clue. Okay, if you bump that moose, he's going to run five miles. Right. And he's, he's going to die surrounded by wolves. That's it. Nothing out there dies a peaceful death at home surrounded by friends and family. No. Everything in nature is eaten by something. You know, and human beings living in nature and hunting for food like that, that's how we survive. Right. We're all the descendants of those people. And that programming is still in there. Yeah. And I think it comes out in bad ways. You know, predatory behavior among humans, you know, is not always a killing. I mean, you have people that are you know, social predators and things like that or of sexual course. predators or of course. just, you know, womanizers. It, that, that aggression, you know. It, it manifests be, somehow. It manifests in, in ways which are very unproductive. But... Living off the land isn't one of them. Living off the land is what it's designed to do. So then is that your, I mean, as part of your ministry, of course, it always has been, but is that, is that a message to the people listening, men and women? Get, I mean, what's your, get out there? Get, like, get out I, in the woods? Well, I do, a, I do a lot of ministry with men's groups. And I think masculinity is something which our society frowns upon. We don't want it to be expressed. And I think it's the thing that's sorely needed more than ever is yeah. for men to, to, to stand up and act like men and not just overgrown boys, you know, right. to take responsibility, to act on courage, to, to take risks. That's the things that, that we as men do and risks need to be taken and people need to be stood up for and people need to be defended. And we need, you, no matter how much people deny that we need men to be, to, to be in those roles. We absolutely do. I mean, as a Christian, okay, right. I believe I'm, I'm not a pacifist. OK, that I, I firmly believe that if if the best men in this world, I'm not saying I'm, I'm in that rank. I'm not talking about myself. So to, I try to be as good a person as I can. I want my life to emulate that of Christ, you know. But if the if the good men, the moral men, the upstanding men in this world are not also the most dangerous men on the planet, then we will be ruled by brutes and tyrants. Mm-hmm. OK, 
that the best among us need to be the most dangerous. Right. Okay. The the ones who, yeah, we are not to, the most dangerous thing you should be, you should do that you could ever do in this world is to attack a man and his family at home. That should be just understood. Right. You know, like in Brazil, if you jumped over the wall and had a pit bull in there and that pit bull kills you, there's no repercussions for that. Right. Okay. Cause why would you jump into a, over a wall when there's a pit bull there? Yeah, that's like your you're personal just, safety. You're, you're zone, stupid. Yeah. You know, you jump over the, you jump into the bear cage at the zoo and the bears maul you. Well, surprise, you know, we'll play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Yeah. <laughs> that's how it should be to attack yep. a good man in his home. Right. You know, and I think we have this idea that, oh, to be good, I have to be totally pacifistic and be a doormat. No, right. not at all. Right. I mean, the evil men in this world should fear. They, they're the ones who should live in fear, not the good. They should live in fear. They should, you know, be, you make you make those life choices, you know, and, and my, my whole ministry in life was to get people to, to not make those life choices, you know, to working with, you know, kids that were in danger of gangs and, and falling into that lifestyle in Brazil. And um, not all my kids, a lot, a lot of them. I had, I was teaching my, my youth group one Saturday night. And uh, all of a sudden I see like this uh, four man tactical unit from the police come barging in the back door of the church and they're, they're in there and I'm, I'm up front. I can looking right at them. And uh, these four cops come bursting in the room and I'm like, Whoa, what's going on? And I go back. He's can I help you guys? And he's like, yeah, we saw a bunch of kids coming. There they are. And they're coming down the stairs. And is I'm it, like, these are my kids. These are, he says, do these kids belong here? I'm like, yeah, they, he goes, yeah, yeah pastor. We, we, we saw a bunch of kids pop in here and they didn't look like church kids. I'm like, yeah, I'm not working with church kids. I'm working with the neighborhood. Right. You know what I mean? This is, they're here, they're here for, for, because they need it. Yeah. Cause they need to be here, you know? And, and they're like, Oh, okay. We're, we're, we're sorry. You know, you carry on. But those are the kids I had in the church there, you know, and they're the ones that you saw the impact with, you know, because they're seeing for the first time that there is a, you don't have to be that guy. You don't have to be involved in the drug trade to get ahead in life. So then, so th- would it be your position? And I, I think I, I would agree with this, that that without an outlet for your masculinity, which is just a natural thing that yeah. a man is going to have, then it'll manifest in other violent predatory ways, maybe drug, whatever it is. Was that kind of the message to the students? And how did you see them after they carry the five or six packs? You know, I, I'd see it with things like, uh, you hand a kid a machete, you know, these are city kids. All right. And they're very out of their element. They're in, in the jungle for the first times. They would say off the pavement, you know, for the first times in their lives. And this one kid says, Pastor Mac, you got to remember, we're, we're apartment boys. You know, yeah. they didn't even know it got dark at night. You know what I mean? I mean, they know, but not really they, they're not yet. really connected because the streetlights come on. Right. And in the tropics, the sun goes down directly at the horizon. It doesn't go down at an angle. It goes down at the horizon and poof, the lights go out. 6.30 at night, it's pitch black. We're 15 minutes before the sun was up. And they, they didn't even connect with that, you know, that, wow, it just gets pitch black. Yeah. I, I, I tell the guys, it's going to rain in about an hour. We've been out in the Savannah, you know, it's going to rain in about an hour. You know, we need to get our shelters. Oh, how do you know it's going to rain in an hour? They, they'd be, you know, dragging on me. And and sure enough, an hour later, it's it's raining. Well, Pastor Mac, how did you know it was going to rain? I said, guys, it rains at 530 every night. <laughs> every night, this part of the year, it rains at, starting at 530 at night, it starts to rain. And they did they're always inside. They never, they never connect with these cycles, right. you know, and you give them a machete and you're, I, I tell them, you know, what's the, what's the ugliest sound in the forest? It's the sound of human fingers hitting the forest floor. Okay. You are the boogeyman out here. You are the most dangerous thing in this forest. There's nothing here that has a 16 inch razor sharp tooth like you do. Right. And that thing will hack off a limb. It will hack halfway through your neck. You can lop off someone's fingers without even thinking about it. Okay, you can sink that into your own knee if you screw up. And this is your responsibility. And you've got that. And you see these guys, they're looking at this, this sword, you know. Now they're, they're going to be marching through the jungle and they're learning how to chop with the machete. And you really see these guys get into it. It's like, wow, this is a powerful tool. You know what I mean? It's a dangerous thing. And now I'm, I'm wielding danger. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're going to make fire. We're going to, you know, it, it, it's just these things that they just engage with these manly activities. You know, and then I, then for the paying customers, there's like a, there's a certain skill set which all men believe they should know. There like, is. I w- like, I wish I could identify just trees by looking at them. I feel like my generation right. can't do that. No. I wish I could do that. But you, you probably believe you should, you should probably know how to make a fire. Right? Definitely. Yeah. That, that's like a manly skill. If I don't have a lighter, I'm in trouble. All men, all men believe they know how to shoot a gun. They know how to make a fire and they know how to sharpen a knife. 
And I can tell you straight up. No, they didn't. Okay, that there is somebody out there who will blow your mind with their ability to make a fire, sharpen a knife, or shoot a gun. Okay? And all men believe they need, they, you know, it's like a measure of their masculinity. I had one guy taking the, 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 the um, Bushmaster course down there who was a the Brazilian equivalent of a uh, uh, FBI agent. Right. Okay? And this guy is running, like, major anti-drug ops, you know, and rural operations and things. And he's a major guy in, in their, uh, the, the Policia Federal. He's taking the course. He would not let me teach him how to make a fire. He's like, ah, I know how to make a fire. I know everyone, every man knows how to make a fire. And it was like a measure of his manhood. You know what I mean? That, that uh, his ability. And this is rainy season jungle. And I'm looking at what he's doing. It ain't working. It ain't going to work. <laughs> this is not going to happen. You know, and we're working with the other students and getting them going, you know, and there's like eight guys there and, and everyone else is, has a fire going. And this guy just, his fire was just smoke. He's frustrated and swearing. And I'm like, Hey, uh, do you mind if I show you some things I picked up along the way? You know, and, Maybe we can work through this thing. Okay. And then and he changed after that. He, he, he changed, yeah. but there's a lot of men. They, they, they look at the wilderness, wilderness skills as a measure of who they are at, rather than something they just have to learn like anything else. Like I personally cannot take apart the engine of my car and fix anything. My dad always sent the thing off you know, to a mechanic. He never looked under the hood. You just, you know, he always had the means to just get it fixed. And I grew up not knowing anything about mechanics and I still don't, but you know, I don't, I don't measure that I'm not as much, as much of a man because of that, you know, and, and even knowing my way in, in the wilderness, I, I don't look at, that's not the measure of me as, as a man. If anything, being on alone taught me how weak I was. You know, I, I say when I speak all the time, I said, you know, two things I don't want you to get out of this message is that number one, if I do serious business with God, he's going to cut me a big check. And that prosperity gospel thing is not a thing. Okay? <laughs> well, it's a it, thing, it's, but it's not real. It's a thing, but it ain't a true thing. It's not in the word, you know. Right. And the other thing is that, oh, he spent 66 days out on Vancouver Island living off the land. He must be a strong man. No. My strength was gone by the halfway point, you know, that I was weak. I didn't win this because I was strong. I won it because I was weak. I know I'm weak, but I know where to find strength. And well, that's yeah, in my right. relationship yeah. with Christ. You you won because you're humble enough to know that. No. Well, Right. There's a difference between being humble and being humiliated, you know. And if you if you puff yourself up and you think that if you have to be be seen as the expert, the guy who has all that and everything, and you know just swaggers, you're up. You're setting yourself up for humiliation, you know. That being humble means okay, I'm in the wilderness. It's a wilderness because it's kicked mankind out already. You know, or it wouldn't be a wilderness anymore. There'd be hotels here. You know, it's already one. So wilderness already won. If you're going in a wilderness area, it's because people tried to colonize it and failed repeatedly and they left. And now it's wilderness. You know, like that's the way it is. So you don't go out there going to battle wilderness. No, it's you go out there asking it permission to let you stay and knowing that it could kill you. And I, I think there's a, the other the other extreme of that. There's there's the guy who I I, I say you, you you might swagger into the bush, but you're going to stagger out. That's the way it is. You know, you're you're going to go in there all this. You know, you think you're going to just conquer this place, and it's going to you're going to come out. You know, trailing smoke. <laughs> swagger but in, and stagger. You're going to swagger in, but you're going to stagger out. The other thing is, people have this. The opposite end of that is like the bush hippie idea, where if I love nature, nature's going to love me back. No, you can love nature, and it will feed you to the crows. Yeah, you, know I mean? you can love a bear and it can you, smack If your face I out love too. nature, it's going to love me back and it's all going to go well with me. Um, no, you better have your head about you, you know, and people try and make this distinction, I think, between like bushcraft and living this off the grid natural lifestyle. And that's great. I mean, that's that's a wonderful way to live. And then they, they say, well, and then there's people who are into wilderness survival and they're afraid of the bush. And this it's like, no. OK, you could be living this pristine off the grid lifestyle, getting every ounce of your calories, living in perfect harmony with nature and you fall through the ice. Now you're in a wilderness survival situation. Right. OK, you could be out there, you know, on a hunting trip and living this pristine bush life and break a knee. You're in a survival situation. OK, that there you have to know how to mitigate those risks and be prepared and not uh, fall prey to the things out there that can kill you, which are myriad while you're living that pristine off the grid lifestyle on your own. And, you know, that's a wonderful way to live, but you can die there just like you can die in a city. You can be a lawyer living downtown and there's certain ways you cross the street, right? 
There's certain dangers. There's certain places in the city you don't go at night. And there's certain things you just don't do because you are surviving the natural threats in your environment. You've perfectly adapted your life to live with, with that. Okay, all those dangers. You know, there's, you know, you get electrocuted by things. There's all kinds of modern stuff that could kill you too. And you're already surviving those things. It's just about awareness. Yeah, it's about aware, it's aware, awareness of a different set of things out there that can, can kill you. And the wilderness survival emergencies tend to have a cascading effect where you made one mistake and then it compounded by another mistake. And that thing you forgot that could get you out of it now. And, and knowing, to be, knowing what the dangers are, being prepared to take the means, the modern means to survive and going into the wilderness, no matter what your activity is, okay, to, to be able to carry the items and the, the technological miracles that we have, like a big lighter. Okay, yeah, I can make friction fire on demand with a knife in the woods. Do I want to do that with a broken finger, a broken knee at eight o'clock at night and is drizzling and I realize I'm in the wrong valley, not the one that has my car parked in it? Right. You know, yeah, you can do all that. But if you're doing, if you're conjuring up your survival with blade skills and knowledge, you forgot your preparation. I I worked at a scuba shop when I was a teenager and there was a guy there who was a former Navy SEAL and the real kind, not the ones that just constantly talk. You would never know. Right. Okay. This guy was a seal unless, you know, other, other people, stuff. other people told you he had been a seal. Okay. Put it that way. And, uh, my friend and I, he was, he, John, he was building a 45 from, uh, from parts. And we were talking about this thing and, you know, looking at all these parts and, and Patrick walks up and he looks and he says, huh, guns. He says, yeah, guns are for when you screw up. You know, we're thinking, oh, oh wow. We're going to engage with this Navy seal to talk about, about handguns. He's like, yeah, they're for when you screw up. Right. If you're doing it right, you never need them. Yeah. You know, and that's how wilderness survival is. You carry the preps and stuff, but I'm going to carry a lighter. I'm going to carry plastic sheeting. I'm going to carry the things I'm going to need to set up camp right now. If something goes wrong, if you do it right, you're never going to need it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're doing anything right, you never need it, but you can't leave it at home either. So, I mean, I think you, I mean, not, I think we were so inspired by watching you. We were first off the fact that you're from Grand Rapids made us excited. And then the fact that you won, it's like they, you were just, you just handled you. You carried yourself so well on there. Something that really impressed us was your uh, your wordsmith, and then I, through further research, I realized that you're a fiction writer as well. Yeah, which makes total sense because some of the things you said in there were so t- touching and well crafted sentences that it's like, well, this guy has to be a writer. Let's talk a little bit about that, about your writing career. And has has it cha- have you have you done anything since you, since the alone experience or? Uh, I, no, I haven't. I, I haven't written anything since since alone. I have a a th- the the first three installments of a six part series six uh book series uh called the fall and it's a post-apocalyptic fiction uh, a virus wipes out 90 percent of the human race oh my goodness and the 10 percent that survive it have a natural uh resistance against the virus but they wake up psychotic and they're like i wrote it in response to the zombie apocalypse genre because i i love the idea of humanity being the monster you know what i mean that's us yeah. you know but zombies just don't scare me. Like, like they watch The Walking Dead, you know. They're so slow. Yeah, they're slow and they're not really thinking. They're not, they're not engaging. They're also not competing for your resources. Yeah, right. Okay, they're just dead. And there's no moral... You can't run through a landscape shooting everybody in the head and have no emotional consequences to this. Okay, you can't... You just can't do it. So I thought, how would I do a, a zombie apocalypse story in which the zombies are believable? It, I mean, it could really happen. It could be that way. And there's a major twist in it. I don't want to reveal yeah, it just yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. But the zombies in every zombie apocalypse story become part of the weather. Okay, I say hot, dry with staggering corpses. You know what I mean? Like The Walking Dead. And they and there's always that scene where they just, it shows like the character development where they, they walk into a building and before they were afraid of the zombies and now they just walk in, pop, 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 pop. They shoot them all in the head and they collect their cans of beans and they go. And I'm like, you couldn't do that psychologically. You can't, can't be that way. Okay. The other thing is every survival story, they, everyone's reduced to these savages, just brutal, horrible people. You know what I mean? This, it brings out the worst in everybody. Right. And I've seen time and time and time again, leading people in the jungle there, it brings out the best in them. Okay. And the, the ones that do really well, the groups that do really well, they pull together, you know, like with the intermediate course, they would, they would have this like ration pack we give them and, we give them all a ration pack. And no matter how many students we had, if we had six students, we only brought five ration packs. We had eight students, we only bring seven. And there's always your hand them out. Oh, da, da, da. Oh, oh, man, they're all, we're, we're short one ration pack. I guess you don't get any food. And we just walk away. 
They're, most of the time, they, without even a word being spoken, everybody breaks open their ration packs and just divides up and makes sure that, you know, that, that they cover the slack. All right. And I wanted to write a survival story in which, which is kind of like the theme is if you don't rise to your personal best in the face of your personal apocalypse, you won't survive. Nice. Okay. You have, you have to be, you have to step up, step in. Okay. And, 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 and help people. Okay. And no matter what you have to contribute, you have to contribute. Like, like I tell my son all the time, you have to choose your battles, but you have to choose battle. Right. Okay. You can't opt out. All right. And that's the thing you, you have to step up. And I've seen it so many times. I thought, how would I incorporate that into a story? Okay. A zombie apocalypse story where everybody in the story has something which is critical to the group and they have to step up and it's hard and that I kind like of thing. It. That's awesome. And uh, the other thing that the, the other component of the story I love is my two main characters. Uh, Nick Harris is a, is an Afghan vet. He was a chaplain's assistant in Afghanistan, which you, you find out there's a little more to that than what met the eye. Now, is he an amalgam of actual people you know, or is this just purely uh, yeah, work? Yeah, I, I, people say there's a lot of me in, in Nick. <laughs> okay. And people say, well, Nick's way too way too mature to be 24. You know, and, and, <laughs> well, he's technically 50. but <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's, he's 50. 55, actually. But uh, he's, he's, that's one of my friends who, who recently read the book. He said, I, I love Nick, but he's way too mature. And it's like... He's like my ideal version of myself, I guess, when I was 24. The guy I wish I was. There are 24-year-olds mm-hmm. sometimes that you meet, though, where you're like, wow, that kid yeah. seems older than his Nick has Nick has it pretty pretty, pretty together. And then uh, he's also like a hardcore individualist, conservative. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say Republican because, you know, that doesn't really mean a whole lot. But I would say, you know, the, those uh, conservative values, the, the values of the right, and I don't mean like alt-right, far-right. No, I, you know, I, I totally thing, get what you're but saying, yeah. The idea of... Individual effort, individual reward, taking responsibility for your own actions, pulling you know, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, kind of thing. You know, manning up. Right. Okay. That's you know the the individual and right. individual freedom, individual liberty, individual responsibility. That's where Nick is, and uh, the counterpart to that is Holly. Okay. And Nick's a white guy. Holly's black. She's an East Coast liberal. Yeah. She grew up wealthy, <laughs> and uh, she's a you know a pre med student at Villanova, <laughs> and. Uh, she comes from that that East Coast liberal mindset, but you see, the thing is, is the Republicans and the Democrats are dead. All right, I killed them all. You know, if you want to know where you are in my book, you're rotting at home. You know what I mean? You didn't make it, right? You died. But the they're stripped down to their basic elements, which, like, which is so far removed from Republican and Democrat that it's just yourself. Yeah, but down. if you think if you think about it, what we lost in the in the U.S. right now. Yeah. Is that the values of the conservatives, and I don't know how you, you want to define these things, the values of the conservative and the value of the liberal. And I'm talking classic conservative and classic liberal. Right. Okay. They both have value. Right. All right. And they've been so hijacked by this screed, by people just screaming at each other. Okay. And, and demonizing each other that, you know, individual rights and freedoms absolutely matter. Of course. Okay. And so does collective action course okay you don't get an interstate highway system unless you do it as a collective yeah that's the thing everyone wants to act right? like there's it's this way or that way it's all yeah, of the it's, we have to figure out together it's, yeah <laughs> and it used to be that the two-party system is supposed to kind of emulate those things you have one party which is looking at the the wealthy landowner the the producer the guy who owns the factory he's got real concerns right and so does the guy who works there yes you know and and anymore i mean my entire life it's been the demo public crap party Okay, that the big money, global, one world, you know, big, big money interests have so hijacked Washington that the the rest of us are just forgotten. We're just we're just grist for the mill. Yeah, I think I think the the, the people in Washington are so in, it's like the banks that were too big to fail. You know what I mean? Exactly. I feel like Washington is too corrupt to prosecute. I mean, if we knew the level of just I know corruption and, and just taking and the opportunities that these people have to just they write laws and they get back and they get stock options before they're released. And oh my goodness. It's, it's, all, it's m- rampant. I it's agree. rampant. I, I agree. Okay. And that's the beauty of a zombie apocalypse. Oh yeah. You get to, you get to <laughs> kill the, you, know, you burn it, literally burn it all the ground, you know, <laughs> right. and then start over. But what it did for Nick and Holly is like, like Nick's running around there confronting the world out there. Cause he, he's living in a trailer, you know, and he has to go out into that and he's confronting it directly. Holly's literally living on a mansion on a hill. Right. Okay, and she's got a pantry full of food, and she's not going outside at all. And uh, it's it's great that I get to strip them down. And when they when they meet, there's this one scene where she's like totally impressed with him that he has the courage to go out there and confront this world. And 
he's thinking, you know, he, at this that point, he's actually shot four people in defense because they attack on sight, you know. Right. And uh, she's been putting food out for them. She's been trying to feed them. And he's like totally blown away by her compassion that she's been actually caring for these people. And he's been fighting against them yeah, because he had to. Right. And she's been feeding them because she could. That's where her point of view is, you know, that we have to be, we have to, we have to work together. We have to care for each other. We have to, these people need help. And I have I, the ability to help, you know, and that's where the bootstrap guy, the conservative, that's where we fail as a conservative. I'm saying we, cause I am a conservative, but right. conservatives fail when we have a lack of compassion. Yeah. Okay. The, the liberal fails when they, they subsidize, uh, dysfunction. Right. You know, I'm where they have compassion on the dysfunction that could be corrected. Right. Okay, that person could learn not to be dysfunctional. Yeah, dude, I'm totally into, yeah, what you're saying. And we're totally. just going to keep them in that perpetually in that, that dysfunction. And that is also a failing. So, yeah, I get to explore these things in the book, you know, in a, in a barren land no one can hide. And that's where the story is. I mean, it's, it's so parallel with your alone experience, though. Yeah, and I, I wrote mean, it before. There were no zombies out there. But... I wrote it before. I, I went know, out, out saying, there. Yeah. You know, there's a... Yeah, it... So yeah, I guess I guess my life has a a rhyme and a reason to it. I asked you before when we before we started recording if you're writing again. You said no because you're focusing on all these other endeavors right now, and now you have this new mission work, which is so exciting. And, and but you should write still. You got to find a way yeah. to write. You know? I, I, it probably it's, makes it's you a, happy, right? It's a lack of discipline. Yeah. Uh, when I write fiction, I get very absorbed in it, and I get very uh, like my daughter said. Uh, she's is Christmas. She says, Dad, I hate your book. I said, Why is that? She says, Because I feel like Nick and Holly and all the others should be here. <laughs> she knows my characters. You know what I mean? And that I, I, I but I get that way because I'm absorbed by the process, and I, I know my characters very well, and I know the scenario very well, and I know the end point of the story. But they run this. They write the story. I'm, I'm amazed sometimes at the dialogue they come up with. You know what I mean? So that's just imaginary, just imaginary <clears throat> discussion in your head, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I so live, that you had to have used that when you were out in the, out in the I live rest. very much in my head. Yeah. I'm constantly, you know, I'm the guy who everyone's talking and I'm there and I have no idea what happened because <laughs> I, I I left, I checked out, I went, I'm not just doing you know, I just to, wrote a chapter, sorry. I'm just kidding. to a no place, but I went to where, you know, my mind wanted to go. I'm very ADD in that's, that sense. I mean, I, I think it's uh, it's inspiring your work that you did. I mean, my exposure to you was through the show. That's not how you're defined. You're you're also really not defined by being a writer or by being a mission or any of that stuff. Your identity really, as you were saying earlier, is in Christ. Right. That's a hard, kind of abstract thing to understand. Well, it so all I flows from do, there. But you're doing a great job of living it. You know, living the way that you want, that you want to portray. And I'm telling you, as a person who I, I like to work hard too. I'm a, I like personal responsibility and all that stuff, but there are times where in my head, I might start complaining about something and seeing guys like you live in the wilderness on your own with nothing, with 10 items, one of which is a sleeping bag cover or whatever. I mean, I can't really complain about not having enough screws for up here or whatever. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so like, I, I think it's so cool to see the, the kind of example that you set your kids seem like they're all happy kids. Your son is an excellent, he's a monkey of some sort, but you know, it just, it's clear to me that like you're doing, you're, you're living the way that you're talking, you're living. And that's really inspiring. And, and uh, it's cool to see, man. It makes me want to be better. Well, thanks. I, I, it's yeah. Me too. Yeah. You know, me too. I want to be better. Um, I'm not a perfect person by any, and that's kind of one of the difficult, difficult things of having everyone know me because of the show is they saw me out there. I mean, run it at 110 percent you know and i'm not always that guy right you know i do have a sink full of dishes right now <laughs> okay i'm i put my pants on one leg at a time i i can't take off my socks without taking off my shoes that's what they say in brazil you know no chia de meia i should do do stannies i can't take off my socks before my shoes yeah. you know it's just the way we're all just regular people in a lot of ways i'm a, a guy that does stuff in the woods you know but i've i've always wanted to live a life that i uh, was unconventional. I remember my dad talking about his career. He was, he's the ended as as the director of materials engineering at Boeing Helicopters. And he was sitting there one day, and he says, "You know, you know, David, someday every helicopter that I built is going to be parked in a field surrounded by weeds." I thought, "Wow, I don't, I don't want." I mean, that's yeah. Those helicopters save a lot of lives. You know, he like developed the Chinook helicopter, and you know, they're fighting wildfires with them right now. And uh, 
those helicopters did a lot of good. And but he's right. One day they will be parked in fields or museums. Yeah. And that was kind of impactful for me. And I always wanted to work with people because I believe pe- people are eternal. You know, people are around forever. Uh, C.S. Lewis, he said, you know, what's more important, the Roman or the Roman Empire? The Roman. Well, the Roman Empire only lasted a thousand years. Right. That Roman's eternal. Right. You know, so there, so people are eternal. People are not disposable. And that's, you know, no matter what they are, no matter where they are, no matter who they are, people are not disposable. And I believe that we have intrinsic value. And that's what I wanted to do is invest my life in people. Well, I think it's awesome, man. Because I, even in your own kind of deconstruction of the of the conservative, the traditional conservative liberal myth or whatever, not myth, but the reality of it. When you pointed out the flaw of the conservative being, you know, perhaps lack of compassion, you're the model for the, not, not that, you know, you, so if you're listening, you can be compassionate and caring yeah. and also, you know, when necessary, stand up and rip the head off of something to sur- keep your family alive or whatever the right. situation is. And I think <clears throat> this show is all about showing people that there's no way to be. You know, and and so seeing maybe people exposure to you will see. Wow, you I could be this my own prototype that no one else has ever seen before, and I think it's cool. You should run for president. No, no, <laughs> you do not want me being your president. Who knows? No, nah, I know my I know my skill set. Yeah, I, I I am not the guy you want managing such affairs. <laughs> I, I teach, I speak, job, and I write. Yeah. That's what I do mainly. And that's what has me intimidated about this new job is there there is certain administrative functions and you know that sort of thing um but I'm able to delegate now those things aren't being delegated to me I can delegate them to other people and that is a huge relief I just have to find the right people to do those things and hold them accountable rather than being the guy who has to meet with the lawyers and the judges and that sort of thing right that's really excellent I mean I, you'll be able to just kind of once once you get into the job you'll be able to just use your skill set and having a director title will allow you to do that the only I had a question that I wanted to ask you as an, uh, that I wrote down because I wanted to make sure I got it right. By the way, this is great. My research for today for my for this particular day of my work uh, was just to watch alone, which was pretty awesome. That's that's, <laughs> you know, that's not, not bad. bad homework. No. Okay. You said at the beginning of the show you're never you're really never alone because you've got God with you. I wanted to ask you, but still, Jesus gets a little quiet in the woods, right? I mean, it was quiet out there, right? Um, <laughs> maybe not quiet because you're hearing the water and all that other stuff but just... you get out there and it sounds you, 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 the boat leaves the engine noise fades and it sounds like it's silent and after a while after you're there long enough and your instincts are kicking in you're hearing everything and I mean and you, you you hear everything and in terms of in terms of my faith there was a constant uh, I, you know I don't know where other people are in their in their faith in their walk with the Lord, but um, yeah, he's not silent, right? He's not silent, right? You know the 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 one who created the very concept of communication knows how to communicate. Yeah, you know that still small voice is uh, was very active out there, and I was amazed at how much scripture I was able to remember. You know, I didn't have my Bible, but I've been you know preaching for fifteen years in the pulpit, and it, you know, it's all there. It all comes back, and just being reminded of things. Um, I had a, I had a, a habit out there that whenever I was feeling the worst, I mean, just the fatigue is just off the charts and you just can't get the motivation to move. I would open my eyes. I'd look around. I'd find the most beautiful thing in my surroundings. And I turned the camera on it and I'd just shoot B roll of the most beautiful scene. You had so many good, you had so much good. Oh, there's a lot of options. There's a lot of options for that out there. It's a very beautiful place. Even when it's stormy, there's like this stark raw beauty there you know even when the wind is howling and stuff it's like man this place is just just kicking butt you know and and it just looks cool and it's like wow these logs just bashing up against the rocks you know it's like film that for a while right. you know but I, I had that just remember the first time i did it i'm just i was out on the the reef and i'm just like oh man i don't want to i don't want to be here i'm just man i really hurt and i haven't eaten in so long and I'm thinking but man what a beautiful place i'm just gonna shoot beautiful b-roll I mean, there, there's something there because not only are you a, you're you're a writer, so therefore you kind of have like a little bit more of a creative view of things, which made you an excellent contestant because your footage was great. You know, even when you were talking, sometimes you kind of had like from behind was, yourself looking out over to the sun and like yeah, it was kind like of that. a creative outlet. Okay, you you got this camera there, and it it was it was a drudgery as well. Oh yeah, you were carrying that thing around. You're constantly filming, and I found myself getting in a total rut of doing the same things, filming them the same way, and I thought I'm going to shake it up. Okay, I'm going to look for the lighting. I'm going to look, you know, try and get 
and I'd see it came out. through. Yeah, look at that. Look at that beautiful light over there. Okay, I'm going to sil- do a silhouette shot. I'm going to walk out there in silhouette. You know what I mean? And, and then to see them use that. And like, yes, I remember doing that shot just because it was cool. And yeah. they put it in. They saw, they, they appreciated my camera work to, to do that. For sure. But it was, yeah, it became a creative outlet. You know, they, they, they did some training with us about how to frame shots and things like that. Like you don't want to be, uh, you want to be looking, you know, from if you're, on the left side of the frame, you want to be looking to the right, you know, kind right. of thing. And, and that, and so you're not like looking out of the TV, you're looking into the room rather than out of it. And you know, there's a lot of things like that, like correct headspace. You know, you don't want to have it cutting off your head. You want to have, you know, all that stuff is, was part of it. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I wish I did more with my GoPros. I hated fiddling with the GoPros and there was so many things. Like I, wa- I watch people now and I see how things are filmed. Did you see Roland? Uh, have you watched that? Yeah, yeah. Did you see Roland take down the the, the muskox with like a knife? Yeah, <laughs> he had his that thing, yeah. That looked like a video game or something, dude. Yeah, that really, guy was a savage man. He was. He's he's a beast. Oh, he's a beast. Holy cow, man! Yeah, he's very very impressive. I, I actually thought that all of them are. That whole all cast them was really. Amazing. Oh my goodness, yeah. the skill is off the charts yeah. for season. Oh, all this, all this, all the contestants. Yeah. Well, it's such a grown. You know, you were part of the earlier days, but you were season two. Season one didn't have thirty five applicants. It was probably a few crazies that wanted to go. But season two, you really set the foundation where it's going to be hard to get on the show. It's going to be competitive, and you better be really freaking good to, to they win. They had they've had over, uh, well over twenty thousand applicants by this point, and they've got people that they were they were con- seriously considering for other seasons, but couldn't go for one reason or another personal reasons right like uh they wanted nicole on season one and but she had you know life happening and couldn't take off so right. she came back for season two and they brought her out there season one got criticized because it was all just white men yeah there was no diversity in the cast whatsoever and you know that's uh i don't know why but it seems like wilderness survival and bushcraft is like a it's a white guy thing well, yeah, I mean, you know, and it's the and, rural nature, the, the population distribution and all that. I don't know why. I mean, it's, it's not exclusionary, but yeah, it, it, they're, they're always looking for people that are not that dynamic, you know, that demographic. And uh, I encourage people to apply, you know, women, uh, minorities, you know, people that, I mean, because it's, it's like, it's like you never see black guys surfing in the U.S., Right. You know what I mean? You go to the beach, and you, you, you say surfer, you're thinking, you know, blonde. Hey, you know, what's up, man? Hey, dude, you know? <laughs> and then then I remember going to Rio in Brazil, and I'm out there body surfing. And I look around, and, like, all the surfers are black. And I'm right. like, this is so cool. You know what I mean? Yeah, black guys can surf, too. It yeah, doesn't, why, is this, <laughs> why do we divide ourselves? Ah, it's just right. get out in the woods. You know what I mean? You can do it. And, and there's... You you inspire there, dude. When I'm watching that show, there are times where I'm like, "Why are let's just go to the woods?" And then I realize, I mean, I don't have any stuff. I don't have any like, gear steps. or anything. But you know, you like, know? When, when we camp, we've camped a few times. We went out to uh, Colorado last summer, and we camped like in a primitive spot where you actually kind of have to be concerned about bears and stuff. And man, do you? I I personally love the wilderness because it makes me feel so tiny. Yeah. You know, and I think <clears throat> that's good in a world where we're, or we're there's we're at no shortage of feeling like we're really important right. and that's not to say we're not but we're not that important what's important is the whole thing and being and being present for it and seeing you do it out there and the fact that you got money after that's great but i think you you were great i mean you, you showed you showed I, I, I don't want to jinx it if they want us to do like a winter season i i say I, i'd do it without the money but i look i did it with a 90 percent fail rate okay 90 percent of the people that go on the show fail Right. All right. That's just the way it should be. Well, really, hundred percent of the people would fail. Would eventually, yeah. Eventually, if they're left out there long enough, right. except for Roland, yes, <laughs> or Jordan. You know, a cool thing with season six with uh, with Jordan is, spoiler alert, he wins. Right. But I, uh, they had an, they they had their main camp, their main base was in Yellowknife, and then they had like an advanced camp that was like in between there where they had like the helicopter, I guess, and the rescue crew and all that. Mm-hmm. And they were the weather was so bad they were having a hard time getting food out to that camp. So when he won, they took all of his moose and like these giant fish that he had, and they fed the entire advance camp that's a, with his food. He catered the hey, thing. Hey, man, here. that's winning like a boss. When I won, <laughs> I could not even offer them hors d'oeuvres. Hey, would you like this? There's a pine cone in the corner. I could give you <laughs> nothing. I can offer you nothing <laughs> other than good wishes. Yeah, well, I, thanks for coming on the show. You, you've, uh, I, I'm so happy that you agreed to come on. People that are out and about listening to this, Dave's still in Grand Rapids, although you're, you're going to be staying here with this new job. But you're um, st- It's a couple miles down the road from me. But I do imagine that you're still interested once COVID goes away in, in the speaking engagements Absolutely. and all of that. So yeah. go to the show notes where you'll see links to Dave's website. Contact him through there. He's also on Instagram. I don't think you're super active on there. but No, I'm more on more Facebook. Okay, so Facebook and uh, his website. 
And I don't know. I'm sure you can hear it here, but it takes a person with a certain type of experience to be able to talk about these things. And there's very few people out there in the world that can talk about these things like you can. So it's awesome, man. Thanks for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. You're a good interviewer. Well, thank Very you. Very high energy interview. I like, well, I like I'm this. excited about this. You were one of the guys that when I first started throwing around the idea of having a podcast, I wrote, I didn't really write down, but in my head, I wrote down kind of a list of people that are Grand Rapids related somehow and that I would actually be interested in an in interview, <laughs> you know, because there are some people that are around that I could interview, but I don't really want to, but I love, Lone's our favorite show. You're the first time a Grand Rapids person ever won a reality show to my understanding. I don't know. It, I don't I, either, but... It's kind of it's a, it's such a funny show to me in general because you're a guy that has no interest in TV. Yeah, really, right? I imagine you, know, you don't. See I don't want to be. I don't want to be a host of a show or anything. You know? Like yeah, that. I mean, like, of course. I mean, like, it's but like, you're not a guy that's like loves TV or watching reality TV. You're not a guy that wants to play with cameras and stuff all the time. You're a guy that likes to be in the woods teaching other people how to how to be people, you know, right. the, the real way. And it's such a juxtaposition that now you're lugging around all these cameras and having to do that. But you pulled that off well too. So, I say all the time, I could never have written this into my own script. How could you? What, you know, I, Twenty years just, ago, you've been like, wait, there's a show where you're just in and, the woods. And, it, and it's so <laughs> it's so ironic that the the people that produce the show are left field pictures, and it literally came out of left field for me. You know what I mean? It was just so out of left field, and which is fine because I played left field in Little League. So, yeah. well, it's, dude, it's all coming. I'm a left fielder. Field. Thank you so much, Dave, for coming on. We've got a little bit more Vancouver Island ecstasy in the background here it probably makes you want to vomit Dave the rest of us it might make us relax guys Dave was in the wild for 66 days guys Dave was out in the wilderness for 66 days all on his own for me I need to use that to apply to my opportunity to unplug to get back out into nature even if that means just taking a walk down the sidewalk wow We'll let a little bit of calming music and some Vancouver sounds play us out. Have a relaxing weekend, y'all. Peace.